Hello, my name is Russell Swanson, and this is the 10th lecture in a 20-part lecture series on the history of ethics. Today I'd like to talk about the natural, the natural law theory of morality, um, but before I dive into an analysis of a natural law theory or a natural law approach to morality, I would like to develop a little bit of historical context since this lecture series does purport to develop a kind of a, a trajectory through history of developing ideas in the um, ancient philosophical tradition of ethics. And so we have in the lecture series thus far explored some of the ideas that came out of ancient Athens and the ancient virtue theoretical approaches that were developed there. Um, and then we talked in a recent lecture about the transition from the ancient world, from the ancient era of Western civilization to what we call the medieval era of, of Western civilization. Very broad brushstroke numbers here that may be just useful for kind of in an oversimplified way seeing the historical structure here. The ancient era was about a thousand years, let's say, um, from about 500 before zero to about 500 after zero. And then the medieval era is about another thousand years, let's say, again, nice round numbers from about 500 after zero or 500 in the common era to about 1500 in the common era. And then we'll use that date to talk about the rise of the modern era. So that medieval era though is, is often further subdivided uh, by historians into the early middle ages and the late middle ages. And while we could talk, I think meaningfully about the sort of what uh, we could call the material conditions of existence that were different in these different phases of the history of Western civilization. Another way to understand these different phases and how they're divided is by understanding the different ways that humans looked at life during these periods of time. And so in the last lecture, the ninth lecture in the series, we talked about how we made a transition with the collapse of Rome away from the humanistic philosophies of the Greco-Roman tradition and towards the sort of otherworldly faith-based religious philosophies of the medieval period. In some very general sense, while there are many good thinkers that are present during the medieval era, they're very much constrained by the cultural reliance on religion that will dominate the early Middle Ages, roughly 500 to 1,000, and the late Middle Ages, very roughly 1,000 to 1,500. Um, however, again, if we use these sort of rough historical um, markers, you can see a bit of a development or an evolution of thoughts about morality and thoughts about life as we move from the early Middle Ages into the late Middle Ages. And I have associated for you the divine command theory of morality with the thinker uh, Augustine of Hippo, later known as Saint Augustine, and uh, you know this, this reliance upon scripture and this turning in some ways away from a reliance upon our own skills of observation and reasoning, a sort of a rejection of that ancient uh, humanism and, a, and, a, and a turning toward what is thought to be sort of a supernatural light uh, outside the cave, if I can use that platonic metaphor, in the city of God, and the revealed truths that uh, Augustine would have identified as coming from the city of God uh, and, and sort of giving us the opportunity while in the city of man to turn our attentions in the right directions and live our lives according to scripture and revelation and get the most out of life. This is again a divine command approach to morality and that's associated with the early Middle Ages. But um, what we're going to see develop in the history of, let's say, Christian theology in particular, but I do think it, it has parallels in what happens in Judaism and Islam as well, is that a simpler scriptural sort of fundamentalist account will over time, over centuries, often give rise to something more sophisticated, uh, something a little bit more philosophically nuanced, it's something along the lines of what I'm calling today a natural law theory of morality. And so that happens in <clears throat> particularly, let's say, what we would think of as uh, Catholic Europe uh, very slowly 
uh, in the late Middle Ages. But roughly by the time you get to the 13th century, something pretty significant is shifting in the Christian theologian, uh, theological tradition. And in general, one of the things that's going on here is that we're beginning to see the return of Greek philosophy, which had largely been lost in what we would think of as the Catholic sort of regions of the leftovers of the Western portion of the Roman Empire. Um, Greek philosophy had been pushed out of both uh, what becomes the Holy Roman Empire and to a certain degree Byzantium. Although many Greek texts survived in the Byzantine Empire, philosophers were no longer welcome. And those philosophers took Greek philosophy to places like Damascus and Baghdad and eventually in the flourishing and golden ages of the Islamic empire, sort of kept alive a lot of the Greek philosophy as we know it today. And then eventually, right, the Islamic empire is gonna come out of the Middle East and spread across Northern Africa, and then across the Straits of Gibraltar into mainland Europe itself, uh, what's in what's called the Iberian Peninsula of Spain and Portugal. And, um, and by the 12th century and the 13th century, but particularly by the 12th century, let's say, and the, and the early 13th century, um, you'd see an incredible amount of philosophy and medicine and astronomy and mathematics within uh, Muslim controlled portions of the Iberian Peninsula. But what has been happening slowly since about a thousand is that, uh, Western Christianity, let's call it for simplicity's sakes, Catholic Christianity, has, has launched the Crusades, which is about a 200-year period of attempt to sort of retake what are holy lands in the Jewish tradition, Christian tradition, and Islamic tradition, all of them, right, to have, have uh, claim to the holy lands. But this, the Crusades were about 200 years of particularly uh, Western Christian um, collectivization and attempts to retake portions of the Holy Lands, which strangely bled over into some military conquest into Byzantium itself. Remember that Christianity had sort of followed the schism that had happened within the Roman Empire, and you get Catholic, Catholic Christianity that develops in the West, remnants of the Western Roman Empire, and Eastern Orthodox Christianity will develop in the remnants of the Eastern uh, Roman Empire, and that's going to be the Byzantine Empire, and for simplicity's sake, we'll call the Western portion the Holy Roman Empire, and there had been, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a schism between the leader, the Pope of the Holy Roman Empire, and the and the patriarch of the Eastern Orthodox Christianity of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, and so there was not an awful lot of uh, cooperation. And um, in fact, there had been open hostility by the time you get to the late period of the Crusades. You know, at least one of the Crusades had, had sacked uh, Constantinople itself. And this um, had the kind of indirect, but but I would say ultimately pretty positive effect of opening back up the far eastern reaches of the Byzantine Empire and pulling some of the Greek texts that had been maintained there uh, out of there and eventually getting those retranslated -transla now into Latin in, uh, the, in sort of Western Europe. And the same had been happening uh, in, over centuries in the form of what was known as the Reconquista, which was Western Christian Europe's attempts, attempts to reconquer uh, Spain and Portugal. And as that had happened, slowly this frontier opens up in Western Europe where we are getting uh, recoveries of um, Arabic texts in particular that had kept alive Greek philosophical traditions. And, and probably the greatest commentators in the Muslim world on Greek philosophy, specializing on in Aristotelian philosophy, had lived and worked and written um, near the great library in Cordoba, Spain, which uh, by the 13th century was just one of the great libraries of the world. But when it was, when Cordoba itself was reconquered, 
you know, I think it was literally hundreds of thousands of Arabic scrolls were recovered and slowly over time, we're going to see these, you know, Syriac and um, even Persian texts and Greek texts coming out of Byzantium. And then these Arabic texts coming out of places like Cordoba will slowly be translated by around the 13th century back into Latin. And that's going to have a huge intellectual impact on um, the Catholic portion of the Christian tradition. And namely, it's going to really impact a group of thinkers who end up studying, I believe, um, first in the University of Paris. I'm thinking of the 13th century German theologian Albertus Magnus and his most influential student, um, uh, Thomas of Aquino, uh, the Italian uh, thinker, or as you perhaps have heard of his name, Thomas Aquinas, <clears throat> eventually made St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, and what was happening, right, in places like Paris in the 13th century is that Western European Christian cities were now competing for copies of these Greek script these Greek writings, right, that had been being recovered from Eastern sources and from Western sources. And then also then competing for what will come to be thought of as a body of scholars who specialize in these translations. Uh, and so these bodies of scholars and collections of work by the 13th century will start to form the basis of the universe, the one body, the universities, of places like uh, the University of Paris in the 13th century. And first at the University of Paris and then later it escapes me off the top of my head where, where Aquinas went to work. Um, uh, but, but Aquinas uh, got this notion in his mind of how valuable it could be to try to understand Greek philosophy and how he might, to put it in kind of a simple way that it's often expressed, how he might find a synthesis of Greek, philosoph Greek philosophy and Christian theology. And basically he's gonna pull this off to such an extent that in his late 13th century work, the Summa Theologica, he's gonna just shape uh, Christian theology for the for the coming centuries and he's going to do it by largely incorporating Greek philosophy but specifically Aristotle into Christian theology. Plato will will show back up but for whatever reason Platonic texts are slower to be translated out of these Greek Eastern sources and Arabic uh, Western sources and so Aristotle is going to get about a 200 year head start on Plato in terms of being brought back into, rediscovered, reincorporated into the Western uh, philosophical tradition of the late Middle Ages. And so Aquinas is primarily working with Aristotle to create what is often referred to as his great medieval synthesis of Greek philosophy and uh, and Christian uh, Christian theology, and by the way, I think that in some respects, um, you know, uh, Aquinas is echoing here another 13th century A A Arabic uh, philosopher, Ibn Rushdi or Averroes, as he's known as his name when his name is Latinized, who had lived again in Cordoba, Spain, and worked there. And Averroes had already done something like then his. The, in the Islamic tradition, because Averroes was this great translator or commentator, I should say, on Aristotelian philosophy, and but he was still living within a Muslim uh, empire. And so Averroes had tried to show how Greek philosophy and Islamic uh, scriptural traditions could be synthesized. And now Aquinas is going to be the one in uh, Western Christian traditions to, to pull this off most successfully in his summation of Christian theology, the Summa Theologica of the late 13th century. Um, and again, he's following the work of Albert the Great. And, and this was pretty daring work, I would say, in the 13th century, because many Christian 
uh, theologians at this time would have been incredibly suspicion, suspicious of pagan philosophy, non, let's call it non-Christian philosophy, particularly for the way that this non-Christian or pagan philosophy seemed to discount the notion of a personal deity. But, but Aquinas, as influenced by Albert the Great, saw that in some ways this was the future of Christianity. This was the way that Christianity would need to update itself in order to uh, survive in some sense. I mean, I'm going to give uh, Aquinas that, that credit, that in some sense he realized that if Christianity just turned its back on what he thought, I think, to be the, what he would have argued was the genius of Greek philosophy, that in some, say, in some ways Christianity would become increasingly at odds with that and may have trouble perhaps uh, maintaining its sense as sort of the dominant paradigm for thought in Western civilization. And so Aquinas in some ways salvages Christianity by finding a way to synthesize Greek philosophy and Christian theology. And to say this in another way, what Aquinas pulls off in the 13th century, which again, I want to just sort of emphasize that date to, to kind of emphasize how radical and forward thinking this was in some respects. What Aquinas did was he developed a sense for how the life of, life of faith, because, you know, of course, be clear about this. Aquinas was a deeply, deeply uh, religious person with deep, deep faith in the Christian tradition and Christian revelation. But what he tried to show us is how the life of faith and the life of revelation and the life of reasoning, right, the life of philosophy could be shown to not be at odds, but actually complementary to one another. Remember that Aquinas, as a 13th century theologian, would have you know, cut his teeth on disputations. He would have studied Christian theology yeah, at these newly emerging universities by disputing, you know, uh, interpretations of Christian scripture, which, you know, is going to do two things for him. He's going to be, you know, an absolute giant of a scholar of Christian revelation, but he's also going to understand this point we made in a previous lecture that, you know, the most well-intentioned, well-informed, and thoughtful scholars of a scriptural tradition can disagree on interpretation. And so when he begins to wrestle with the remnants of Greek philosophy, and particularly Aristotelian philosophy, what he's going to see is non-Christian sources of something that looks pretty darn profound. And so this is going to lead him to the conclusion that while revelation is God's greatest gift to us, in the late Middle Ages, Aquinas is going to argue that another important gift from the divine to the human is our ability to observe and to reason about our observations. And so Aquinas is going to begin to build that way, a synthesis of the life of faith and the life of reason, a synthesis of the life that relies upon scripture, you know, as divine command theories of morality do, but then to sort of update and to nuance divine command theory into something that is supplemented by what we'll call the natural moral law, which is, to put it somewhat simply, written into the fabric of reality itself by God. And then God gives us the, the ability to observe and to reason so that we can come to understand some of what God wants of us and have this other source for it, right? Revelation, particularly in the Christian tradition, is a closed window right? And if we, that closed window contributes to two things. One, the difficulty of interpreting scripture from many centuries ago to contemporary issues, but also it just doesn't speak to these contemporary issues in direct ways. And so Aquinas says, well, what God must want us to do then is use these God-given abilities to observe and to reason in order to figure out from, not just from scriptural sources, where we need to, to go beyond scriptural sources to figure out 
the natural moral law that God built right into the fabric of reality. And so here's one way to start to develop this, um, this notion of Aquinas of how we synthesize, how we bring together these sources of what should guide our lives from scripture and uh, from philosophy. And so here's a teaching of Aquinas' known as the, the, the four levels of law that govern how the universe works and how it should be working. And at the highest level, Aquinas would identify the eternal law. And the eternal law is how everything works and how it should work in the mind of the creator of everything, in the mind of God. And the good news is that we have every reason to believe that there is, right, a, a law, an eternal law, that governs this universe in an orderly way and governs our lives in a moral way. The trouble is God's mind is infinite or eternal and our finite minds, while they are in some ways gifts from God, they are finite and fallible and we will never be able to fully comprehend the eternal law. Perhaps God understands, perhaps due to God's understanding of our inability to comprehend the infinite nature of the eternal law, God chooses to reveal in certain parts of history certain truths to us. This yields what's called the divine law. Okay, so you got the eternal law in the mind of God. The second of the four levels of law is divine law, basically scriptural commandments, as we've talked about them in the earlier lecture on divine command theory of morality. Now, this level of law is the highest and most important level of law, but as we've said, there's two things about this. One, it does lead to some difficulties in terms of interpretation. Take something as simple as thou shalt not kill. In some sense, that can't mean literally no killing. I mean, that would mean like you can't kill a bug or you can't kill a plant or something like that. So even something as simple as thou shalt not kill involves a, some aspect of interpretation, right? And so in some sense, Aquinas is going to say, we're going to need reason just to have a debate about interpretation. Uh, but we also uh, believe in, in particular scriptural traditions, right, that revelation is a closed window. And so for whatever reason, God gives us revelation for certain periods of history, but doesn't beyond that. And so we now have some reason, Aquinas thinks, to believe that we need to be able to go beyond scripture, that scripture is not enough. But God has given us the powers of observation and the powers of reasoning in order to understand life. And in some sense, I think that Aquinas and others see in the Greek philosophers and even in the Arabic philosophers, right, like evidence for how, while Arabic Muslim philosophers don't have access to the New Testament and Greek philosophers like uh, uh, Aristotle are born prior to the life of Jesus and so certainly don't have any access to the teachings of Jesus or, Chris, or Christian revelation and Christian scripture. Still, Aquinas is going to realize, right, that Greek philosophy is amazing and that uh, Arabic and Muslim philosophy is amazing. And how is it how can that be if divine law is all that matters? And so, you know, based on the reasoning we've developed so far, human beings, right, have these powers given them to, by God, Aquinas would think by the Christian God, and whether they know that source or not, they have these abilities for observation and reasoning. And so this would explain the profundity and depth of insight and complexity and subtlety that we see in these pre-Christian sources and these non-Christian sources like Greek philosophy and, and, and Islamic philosophy. And so this generates for Aquinas the idea that there is a third level of law below the eternal law, which is forever beyond us, below in terms of importance, the divine law, which should always take precedence whenever we can develop a clear and justifiable interpretation of it. We find the natural law. And this is the way that the universe runs 
and how it should be run. And so this encompasses what we think of is when we hear natural law in the modern era, we think of you know, physics and, and chemistry and biology, and that's not wrong, but this would also for Aquinas include the moral law, and that's where I'll focus here. The third level of law, which is less important than divine law, but an important supplement to the second level of law, divine law. A complement and supplement to divine law as a human, uh, uh, available to human source of understanding of how life should work is the natural moral law. And that is when humans use their human abilities for observation and reasoning to study the creation of the divine, the universe itself, and to try to reason out an understanding of how we should live that again, might supplement and complement what we find at the level of divine law. Let me say a little bit more about how I'm trying to use these words of supplement and complement here. Aquinas is going to argue, and I'll try to give you examples of both, that we can observe God's creation and we can reason about God's creation carefully. And if we do, we can generate perhaps some evidence for certain interpretations of scripture. And so it would be common in the 13th century in the disputations amongst Christian theologians to even use Greek philosophical sources in defense of a certain interpretation, right? So sometimes um, observation and reason-based understanding of life, what we're calling this natural law level, of, let's just call it the, the third level of law, natural law, this can be used to help us justify certain interpretations of scripture. I'll give you an example of that eventually. In other cases where scripture just doesn't seem to speak that, that clearly or at all to some moral issue uh, that we're confronted with, natural law can be an important and crucial supplement to what we find revealed in scripture. Right? So it's a complement and a supplement. Natural law is a complement and a supplement to divine law. And so the natural moral law is often described as human reason's attempt to approximate the eternal law in the mind of God. By studying God's creation, we find in nature, in creation, our best guess is too weak a word, our best approximation of what God intended in terms of how it all should work. And in particular, this is where you're going to start to see uh, Aristotle and Aristotelian metaphysics and Aristotelian kinds of thinking come back into the picture so powerfully for Aquinas. Because if we study God's creation, one of the things we're going to see about it, according to Aquinas, is that it is teleological, as Aristotle had argued so many centuries before in the ancient era. And so let's remind ourselves what that means. God's creation, Aquinas would argue, is teleological in the sense that if we observe it and reason about it carefully, we can come to know the purposes. And now we can tell, you know, poor Aristotle, who's long past, couldn't have known because he lived prior to Jesus, uh, that in some sense that the, the author of the purposes that we find evidence for in existence uh, is God. And so God is the author and creator of this teleological or purpose-filled universe, and that if we observe God's teleological universe, we can find ways to reason out how we should behave in order to align our conduct with God's intended purposes, at least our best, our best approximations of God's intended purposes. And so the natural law is the third level of law out of the four levels of law as Aquinas saw them governing the way the universe works and how it should work. Eternal law, divine law or scripture, natural law, which is sort of the philosophical attempt to understand, using the metaphysics here of Aquinas, God's teleological universe. And then 
both divine law and natural law give rise to another less important but still important level of law called human positive law, meaning that the actual codes that humans create, which ideally um, govern societies in ways that are consistent with the principles of natural law and divine law. Okay, so those are the four levels of law, eternal law, divine law, natural law, and human positive law as like literally legal codes. And those are in descending levels of importance. Um, the top is the most important and the, the bottom is the least important. Still, they're all important. And this is a, a, the, my attempt to begin to illustrate for you uh, another way of understanding the uh, what's called the medieval synthesis of the life of religion and philosophy, uh, the synthesis that Aquinas attempts to pull off by showing how the life of faith and the life of reason can complement and supplement one another instead of being at odds with one another. Okay, and so what I'd like to give you now is to finish up is a little bit more in terms of understanding how does a natural law approach to morality sort of arrive at more specific and concrete recommendations for how we should behave. Um, and so to spell this out, I'd like to just basically give you what amount to the three basic uh, assumptions of a natural law approach to morality. Um, one would be a certain metaphysical conception of existence, and that is primarily, uh, most importantly, teleological, right? So there's a view of reality that is required here. It also, by the way, kind of assumes that there is this creative source, let's call it God, and then God builds a reality that is teleological, that is purpose-filled, okay? And so if our metaphysics include a notion of a God that builds a teleological reality, natural world for us, then we can get to the second basic assumption of this approach, which is that what is natural, based on our observations of this natural world, the purposes, the natural God-given purposes of things provide us guidance with how we should then conduct our lives. What is, uh, what is right is in some sense what is natural. Uh, what is right or what is moral, what is ethical in some sense, is what is in agreement with God's teleological uh, universe or what is uh, in agreement with God's natural purposes for things. Okay, again, I'm going to give you some concrete examples of this in just a second that should help us with how a natural law theorist would sort of the process by which a natural law theorist would 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 uh, reason in order to arrive at natural law principles, which would then inform our human positive laws in society. Um, um, and so the, the third basic assumption of a natural law theory, right? The number one assumption is sort of the metaphysics, and that is the that God's teleological universe. The second basic assumption is that we can read into that teleological universe in order to generate uh, uh, ethical principles or moral principles of actions. And then the third basic assumption is, as I've implied several times throughout this lecture, that reason um, is itself the God-given ability of human beings um, that is required for us to um, process our observations of God's teleological universe in order to arrive at these conclusions. And so again, I just want to highlight sort of how radical this must have been in the 13th century for such a deep believer, so deeply within a society of deep believers where church and state are still united and very seriously, sort of religious norms are very seriously enforced at every aspect of society, for Aquinas to argue, as he did in his Summa Theologica, that the dictates of reason, that the sort of commands of reason are in some sense just as important as the commands of scripture. 
right? Like that is, I, I think that's really radical 13th century stuff there. And again, Aquinas is doing this in the Christian theological tradition in a way that somebody like Averroes would have done this in the uh, Muslim um, uh, uh, religious uh, societies. And in some ways they're both, I think, pretty radical and, and, and uh, behavior uh, uh, thinkers whose behavior, um, you know, really sort of put it on the line. But, but for Aquinas in particular, this is going to end up being really foundational, particularly for Christianity as it develops in this part of the world, you know, France and Italy and, and Spain, um, in what we think of as maybe the Catholic Christian tradition, Aquinas will just become really foundational there. And so this natural law theory of morality will sort of just really be built into particularly this part of Western civilization that's going to leave long, long imprints and have a lot of sort of influence upon um, what, what you and I inhabit if we live in what we would call Western civilization to this day. I'll begin to foreshadow a point I want to make at the end of lecture here, which is that this approach to morality will not be very popular in the modern era. And we'll talk about that in the next lecture, next two lectures in particular. But it's going to be culturally very, very influential. And one of the really important moral, one of the really important remnants of this natural law approach to morality that we're going to see survive culturally and be very, very influential culturally into the modern era would be the recognizable moral idea of the natural human right. That in some sense, this is very much like what we've described so far, and that is that God sort of builds a moral law into the fabric of reality. Um, and what we'll talk about by the end of lecture in terms of some of the challenges that will eventually emerge to natural law theory um, which I'm going to return to here in a moment, this will eventually also impact this very important and influential construct of the modern era, which is the idea of the natural human right. But let me return to um, a kind of a, a fleshing out of the natural law by giving you some examples. First, I'll review the three basic assumptions of a natural law theory. Uh, as I've said in many of my lectures, first thing to understand is sort of the conception of reality or the metaphysics that underlies this particular approach to morality. And here I've said that the metaphysics of the natural moral law theory is, uh, or the natural law theory of morality, is the teleological, the God-created teleological universe. And then the second major assumption is that what we can look at sort of the facts of this God-given teleological universe, this God-created teleological universe, we can look at the way it is and reason out the way we ought to be. We can look at God's natural purposes for things and reason out how we ought to ethically and morally conduct our lives. And that the third assumption is that God has implanted in us the, the powers of observation and thought in particular, reasoning in particular, and logic, right? Not as a threat to the life of faith, but as an important complement and supplement to our life of faith and our faith in scripture. And so let me now uh, develop for you two examples of how a natural law theorist might sort of reason out a basic principle of our ethical or moral lives. And I'll start with one that complements scripture, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go to another that more supplements scripture, right? So I'll start with one that is going to help us to uh, agree upon a certain interpretation of scripture, and then I'll develop another theory, another uh, example that sort of goes beyond what we see uh, in scripture and therefore sort of supplements our moral understanding of our lives going past in some ways what's available to us via scripture. So first the one that complements. Okay, let me develop this kind of quickly. And um, uh, the, the idea here, right, is that let's say if we're talking about New Testament scripture here for a second, and in particular the Gospels, you could make a pretty good case, I hope you would agree, 
that love and forgiveness and generally sort of kindness and respect towards one another is a part of a decent interpretation of the Gospels, okay, and the teachings of Jesus. Okay, now how might a natural law theorist go about reasoning his or her way to a similar conclusion without turning to something like the Gospels. And, and, you know, this is actually an interesting sort of conundrum for somebody like Aquinas because he's aware enough of other cultures to realize that they have, in many cases, arrived at similar ethical principles without the benefit of the Gospels. And so he's got this sort of, you know, question in his head that he thinks he's found an answer to. How do non-Christian cultures seem to arrive at similar ethical principles without the benefits of reliance upon something like New Testament or that subset of the New Testament that is the Gospels? Well, here's how a natural law theorist might do it. And again, important point, this is the, one of the ways in which a natural law theory of morality transcends the divine command theory of morality by showing us how somebody without access to particular scriptures can still possibly arrive at ethical uh, ideals and principles using human reason. And one thing to see here is this is going to definitely foreshadow the sort of return of the philosophical experiment in the Renaissance and how that will be reborn and expand into the modern era. But here in this case, I'm showing you more specifically how natural law theory, natural law theories of morality, whether they're Jewish or Islamic or in this case Christian, go beyond uh, divine command theories are more philosophically subtle and more philosophically explanatory, right? Because they can explain how non-Jewish or non-Christian or non-Islamic societies can arrive at similar conclusions to those societies that are pulling from Jewish scripture or pulling from Christian scripture or pulling from Islamic scripture. Because the natural law traditions that emerge within Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are all going to turn to the similar kind of solution, which is that God gave us this capacity for logic and critical thought and reasoning for a reason, so we can observe God's creation and figure some things out for ourselves. And so returning to our example here, I set up for you that one decent, perhaps, interpretation of the Gospels is to say that we have a God-given commandment to try to love one another, okay? Doesn't take much interpretation, I would say, to interpretive work to pull that out of the Gospels, right? That's, I hope, totally consistent there. On the other hand, how might a natural law theorist, without appealing to Scripture, arrive at a similar conclusion? Well, the line of reasoning might go something like this. Let's observe God's teleological universe, and let's see what we see. Well, let's observe ourselves, right? And here's that move. Observe reality, and, and in particular, observe ourselves as a sort of a subset of reality, and we'll draw important ethical conclusions from knowing ourselves. And so the first move here is to know that it seems as if God has created us to be creatures that live together, social animals, right? God did not create human beings, homo sapiens, to live solitary existences, right? Like some creatures come together, even creatures that reproduce sexually, come together, reproduce, and then split back up. That's not us. We have good evidence in our observations of human beings to conclude that God has created us as social animals. Okay, if God created us as social animals, do we then, reasoning, uh, 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 assume that God created us as social animals so that he could draw us together into conflict or that he could draw us together into cooperative living. Okay, so the natural law theorist, you can see where that's going, would conclude that God seems to have built us as social animals so that we could learn to cooperate. And if that is the case, is cooperation furthered by strife and by conflict and by disrespect and unkindness? Or is cooperation furthered uh, by kindness and respect and ultimately perhaps learning how to love one another and forgive one another?
And so now we can see how a natural law theorist, without appealing to scripture at all, can find evidence that corroborates a certain interpretation of scripture without looking at scripture, by just looking at this, again, the framework is this, tele this God-created teleological universe using God-given skills of reasoning. We can observe very carefully and see how the natural order of things gives rise to the ethical order of things. How things are allows us to see in the natural law theory tradition how things ought to be. Okay, so there's my example of how a natural law theorist would argue or reason in order to develop a, a kind of a principle like we should try to be kind to one another and being respectful of one another is a good thing in order to complement scripture. Let's turn now to an example uh, that would supplement scripture. Okay. Let's turn our attentions to a part of our humanity that we dealt with in our earlier lectures on hedonism, Cyrenaic hedonism in particular, and that is our sexual nature. Obviously, if we observe God's, again, you know, just assume the framework for this discussion, right? Observe God's teleological universe, and what you will find is that God has made us generally sexual creatures, creatures with sexual urges and appetites and desires. And so let us reason about why God would have given us this uh, sexual nature. Well, we don't have to look too far to find a traditional, common, natural law-based interpretation of this let's call it evidence, right? Like the presence of our sexual desires and urges in this framework of God's teleological universe allows us to reason to one possible conclusion, and that is that God has given us a sexuality with the telos of the furthering of the species. That the purpose, the God-given telos or purpose of human sexuality, the God-given purpose of our sexual drive, is for reproduction or procreation. And this is, by the way, a really important teaching of, let's say, the Catholic Church in particular, but actually a lot of natural law-informed uh, religious teachings, whatever scriptural tradition they're associated with. Um, and so we have, we have scripture, which is, you know, largely silent on this specifics of how to be moral and ethical with regard to our sexual nature. It just seemed based on the evidence that we have that Jesus didn't speak much to this issue. And so thank, thank goodness, we might say thank God, right? We have these God-given abilities to reason within this God-given natural moral framework of the teleological universe to figure out that moral sex will be sex that aims at reproduction. Now, in the Catholic interpretation of this tradition, you know, keep in mind that the people and let's say the institution that is there to guide us in our interpretations of scripture and our, in our understandings of the natural moral order are the priest class within the institution of the church. And so, Sex will be slightly complicated within the Catholic tradition by two things. One, it's going to need to aim at reproduction. But two, it's going to need to be within relationships that are sanctioned by the interpretations of scriptural and natural moral law uh, uh, by the church. And so relationships that are sanctioned by the church uh, will set the context for proper expression of our sexual natures. And um, so maybe we would turn to something like Genesis and the idea of Adam and Eve to say that within a relationship between a man and a woman, right, uh, as sanctioned by the interpreters of scripture and the natural moral order here on earth, the church, that relationship, that sex in a relationship sanctioned by the church that aims at reproduction will be moral. That will be permiss morally permissible sex. Now, of course, our sexual desires go beyond that, but 
this is where you know we can see a, a kind of a prime example of how the natural law theorist looks at nature to try to gather evidence about the way from the way things are as interpreted through this framework of god's teleological universe to an understanding of how they of how they should be god gives us a sexual urge but that doesn't mean acting on it in any old way is the right thing to do because we have through this line of reasoning developed an understanding that god gave us a sexual urge so that we could reproduce the species and so this is going to inform like Catholic theological interpretations of moral sexuality to this day. And let's just sort of spell a couple things out that, that should be very obvious. Any sex then that doesn't occur within this church sanctioned relationship and any sex that doesn't aim at reproduction as its final end is going to be morally condemnable. Now, this is slightly nuanced by the fact that the, even the Catholic Church is going to update its theology uh, and its, its, its teachings on human sexuality in the 20th century. Why? In part because, you know, we just come to understand a lot more about sexuality in the 20th century. And I would argue that religious institutions have to continue to evolve in their teachings or they become obviously sort of anachronistic or outdated or, or irrelevant. And I think the Catholic Church has to some degree updated its teachings on human sexuality to include, for example, the idea that, that sexuality is part of literally, as we talked about in an earlier lecture, making love, creating intimacy. And so within church teachings, Catholic Church teachings in particular, we'll see an emphasis on, you know, certain expressions of sexuality that don't immediately or directly aim at procreation are allowable if they further the intimacy between a husband and wife and that strengthens the bonds of the family. But in general, right, what I'm trying to point out here is the connection between the, what is assumed to be the God-given telos of the sexual urge, that is reproduction, and the moral permissibility of sex. The sex. This is why to this day, in let's say a Catholic teaching on sexuality, birth control is seen as immoral. Now again, that's slightly complicated in the 20th century by the by AIDS and by epidemics of socially sexually transmitted diseases. So it's perhaps not as frowned upon to use condoms as it once was, but it's still thought to be immoral. And the reason why it's thought to be immoral is that it sort of literally interrupts the God-given telos of human sexuality, which is about reproduction. Now, there is one technique which you are allowed to use, which sometimes is referred to as the rhythm method, which it refers to sort of timing the cycle of a woman. Um, a woman has a cycle and she cannot get pregnant at all times during her cycle. And so there is the possibility that sex between a husband and a wife can be moral if it's furthering intimacy, even if it is, you know, done in such a way that it sort of times the cycle so that it doesn't aim directly at reproduction. Well, be why? Well, because that's all natural. God sort of built that into the biology of the situation, and, you know, we can't question God's wisdom in that regard. But condoms, birth control pills, diaphragms, those sort of things are going to be immoral by this line of reasoning, by this teaching, right? And by the way, let's just say it out loud. This has been, you know, I, I think for many centuries, a strong source of condemnation for homosexuality, both uh, gay sex and lesbian sex, right? And I just want to sort of point out there that, that, that sodomy or oral sex whether it's between a man or a woman or a man and a man or oral sex between a woman and a woman are all sort of equally condemnable in this framework, right? Because of the way in which they're seen as to be going against the natural law. Now, there are some, there are some other, let's say, biblical sources that are often used in a kind of divine command theory way to sort of justify why maybe a man and a man or a woman and a woman are thought to be more immoral than a man and a woman. But, but my point here, right, in developing your understanding of the natural law theory is to see how this idea of moral sex is tied to the supposed 
telos of the sexual drive. And so in this way, oral sex, sodomy or anal sex, and even many kinds of just, um, you know, playing, so, so we might say fooling around, uh, manual stimulation, for example, masturbation even, right? All of these are going to be in some sense all considered immoral for the same reason within traditions that are informed strongly by this natural law theory of morality, right? All of these things, oral sex, anal sex, masturbation, they all, you know, have nothing uh, directly to do with reproduction. And so that's going to bring moral suspicion on these forms of sexuality. Okay, so this is an example of how a natural law theorist might reason with regard to sexuality, and in this way sort of supplement, add something to our understanding of our moral lives that just is not prominently represented for whatever mysterious reason in Revelation or in Scripture, right? And so in this way, natural law theory is seen as sort of a a complement and a supplement to a divine command theory. In this way, the approach to morality that we associate with the early Middle Ages evolves into something more philosophically nuanced, more philosophically complicated in the form of natural law theory in the late Middle Ages. And as I've emphasized here, particularly because Greek reasoning and Greek philosophy gets reintroduced via these you know, um, Syriac and uh, Persian and Arabic translations, um, Arabic translations particularly coming from Western sources in the Iberian Peninsula and even some Greek sources coming out of uh, Byzantine sources coming to, to the Catholic portions of Europe out of, out of uh, Byzantium. Um, and so, in some sense, natural law theory is kind of a more philosophically advanced religious approach to morality that foreshadows, even in the 13th century, something that will be clearly emerging in the 15th and 16th century in the form of the, of the Italian Renaissance and later in the form of the Enlightenment in Western civilization, when we really begin to fully embrace again what I'll call simply the Greek philosophical experiment and the humanism that comes with that. Um, and in particular, and this is not irrelevant or tangential to where I want to finish today's lecture on natural law theory, in particular, the Aristotelian naturalism, right, that has been reintroduced, the Aristotelian systematic study of the natural world that has been reintroduced from these sources that we've talked about today, will end up playing a role in the renewed interest in systematically studying the natural world, which is going to be further sort of codified into a methodology that today we think of as the scientific method. And the reason why this is not uh, uh, too tangential or, or not, it's, it's it is actually related to this uh, discussion of natural law theory, is that this is going to end up coming back to bite in some ways, this tradition. And there's a real irony here, right? Like natural, natural law theory is influenced strongly by the reintroduction and rediscovery of Aristotle in the late Middle Ages. But at the same time, the rediscovery and reintroduction of Aristotle is going to, you know, eventually foster a renewed interest in the systematic study of the natural world, which is going to give rise to science. And then science itself is going to come back around and cause problems for a natural moral, a natural law theory of morality. And if I can sort of try to put a fine point on it, sort of put a, a, a kind of a detailed place where this is going to hit the natural law theory of morality, it's going to be right in the concept of the telos itself. It's going to be right in the metaphysical foundations, right? Like, so here's that major point of understanding ethics. Ethics is grounded in metaphysics. And when science really changes our conception of reality, pretty dramatically in the next few centuries and undercuts our teleological conception of reality, right? That's going to really hurt the natural law theory of morality because without a teleological basis uh, or metaphysics, natural law theory just sort of collapses in on itself and we're left sort of searching for a different understanding of where morality comes from 
that's going to really yield a radical new series of approaches that we're going to call the modern ethical theories. Um, and to say this another way, right, while I've argued here, and I'll repeat because it's really worth repeating, natural law theory is going to, when I spell it out, sound very familiar to you. Natural law theories uh, or natural law-like interpretations of human sexuality should sound very familiar to you. If you ever have heard of people referring to something as wrong because it is unnatural, right? Like that's very much coming out of this theoretical framework. Right. And that has been culturally very dominant, I would say, even to this day. But more and more, as we move from the late Middle Ages into the early part of the modern, into the Renaissance and the early, uh, um, into the Enlightenment of Western civilization, into the modern era in general, what we're going to see is a tension between the theories of reality generated more and more by the methodology of science and some of the fundamental claims of natural law theory. And I've already said one of the big places is in this first major assumption, the teleological universe will be called into question by the modern scientific worldview. And I'll, I'll say it another way, the modern scientific worldview will just not need the concept of the telos in order to explain certain aspects of the physical, chemical, and biological world better than we've ever explained them before. And because the modern scientific worldview will have more success in explaining the physical, chemical, and biological world than we've ever had before, and because it won't use the concept of the telos to do so, that's going to be a problem for the metaphysics that is the foundation of the natural law view. And now let's also look back at the second major assumption of a natural law theory of morality. It's this idea that we can look at the natural world and figure out sort of the way it is in order to figure out the way it ought to be. Certainly by the time we get to the 18th century Scottish philosopher David Hume in sort of the height of the modern era and the enlightenment of the modern era, that is going to be explicitly called into question. I would think sooner than that, but Hume really puts, puts a point on it and says, look, you cannot get a moral ought from the way the world physically is. Is cannot generate ought. Is cannot derive ought. No amount of thinking and reasoning, Hume will say, about the facts of the natural world will yield what we could call facts about the moral world. You cannot derive ought from is. You cannot derive morality from reality as informed by science. And so more and more in the modern age, we're going to see a te temptation to embrace this dichotomy between the facts and the values. Any values, but specifically the value, the moral values of right and wrong and sort of good and evil. And so this too, this separation of fact and value in the modern age, in addition to the lack of the utility of the concept of the telos in the modern scientific worldview, will eventually really undercut the natural law theory, which will, as I said, this is complex, you know, intellectually, continue to really inform culture for centuries, but it will not inform philosophical dialogue outside of very specific religious traditions. It will inform us in key ways, right? Like, look how fundamental this is in, let's say, the United States of America. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and chief among these rights are the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That Jeffersonian language should sound very familiar to many of us, right? And that language in many ways echoes natural law theory of morality. And here it is, language from the 18th century. And what I'm going to develop for you over, over some of the next few lectures, though, is why there is a crisis looming in the modern age for morality. 
and it is a crisis born out of the tension of the rising conception of reality brought to you by science. We might say the metaphysics of the modern scientific worldview and the tension that will hold or, or have the tension that will create between this metaphysics and these theories of morality like natural law theory and its and its echoes in in important modern ethical concepts like natural human rights i'm going to call this the modern crisis in ethics and my next lecture will be entirely devoted to that but this ends my lecture today on the natural law theory of morality. And whatever you decide about the natural law theory and the critique of it here that I offered you at the end, I hope you find your way to good and fulfilling and moral lives. I wish you well and uh, hopefully see you at the next lecture.